Hello, my name is Adam Murray and welcome to a very special Extra Time where we look at the state of Gaelic football and discuss the need for change. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, uh, we hope you do today as it's really helped us out. Joining Ellie, Mr Briggs and myself today is Cork's finest export, Mr Collins. Welcome to the show, lads. Good to be um, here. So, just talking about football in general and the game in general, I suppose, uh, how do you find that at the moment, Mr. Briggs? Um, yeah, I was actually out for a walk there and I was having a good think about it again today. And I think for me, we can kind of get in, into more of the nitty gritty and <coughs> specifics in a minute. But for me, it kind of boils down to two main parts. Number one is what can you do with the rules? And number two is the competition structure. Right now, I think for me, the competition structure is all wrong. Um, and that, in the short term, that can be easily fixed if you're willing to part with the provincial championships, which most people aren't. Oh, sorry, most people in power aren't. Um, I just think if you change any of the rules, like we've seen with the mark, you fundamentally change the game. And we kind of we'll talk about it a bit more in a while. But um, yeah, it's a more it's a tougher one. It's a tougher one. Uh, what do you think, yeah, Jeff? Yeah, I, I disagree with you already. Like <laughs> you've only one point made, and I disagree with you. Um, I think a lot of the supporters want to keep the provincial championships as well. Like particularly Ulster and Connacht. No, maybe not so much Munster and Leinster because Dublin are just. You know, have Dublin success is killing the game in Leinster and almost nationally you know, at this stage. But uh, I think the Connacht and Ulster championships are still huge uh, success if you win them for the supporters. So uh, I, I would disagree on that a bit. Yeah, uh, just no. I just think that, um, like when I look at it, right, Kerry. Taking it aside, Tipperary won this year, but like, well, does anyone here really expect Tipperary to go and win again next year? Never mind in the next 10 years. Uh, you, you know, in Dublin, you have a one horse race. It suits Kerry and Cork, though, if Cork can get back strong, to have a lopsided draw. And I think if the game is going to progress, there's going, they're going to need to open up the championship a lot more. Ulster is fine, but then, like, you know, let's just say, for instance, Kerry draw. You know, say we say Waterford draw Limerick tomorrow, and then they go on and play Clare, and then Clare, Kerry draw Clare, and they hammer Clare. But like you're in an All Ireland quarter final based on, you know, very little done. Whereas you know, if you're even Tyrone and you end up in the our preliminary draw inside Ulster, you have got four or five unbelievably tough games to get through. And it, they're okay. You can the school of thought where you can say, well, you're battle hardened. But really, with S and C now, most teams are peaking, and the Kerry can peak for one, two, three games. Dublin the same, and uh, I, I just think it, it would suit. I think it would be a much better championship if you opened it up and you had a kind of an open draw, which we can talk about later on, a seeded open draw, and you know, or or supposedly, let's just say what they do in Hurling, where like. Realistically, Fermanagh don't play Waterford in hurling. So, should Waterford? It's a, it's a topic conversation. Should Waterford then, ha, or should, should they be given the opportunity to play Kerry every year, guaranteed? Do you know or have a chance? So, what do you think, Adam? Like, do you think do you think all Waterford or a team like Waterford has earned a right to go and like demand that they get a chance to play against the top teams every year? For the it's it's all about playing the matches. But like if you're getting if you're going to be getting hammered and you're going to be every year you're putting in the same effort and you're kind of uh, like you're not making any progress, which it just it's not really it doesn't really make any sense. And with the provincial channel that it is now, it's kind of I know they're trying to do the the tier two uh, championship after, it, but like they're kind of falling between two stools in the sense that like they're still doing the normal provincial championships and then cutting them off for one or two games after that. So if they're going to do it, I'd say they'd probably have to do it like that you're playing against teams more your own level because that's how, like that's a lot more enjoyable like when you actually have a chance to compete and like it would keep you going more. And, yeah. and Ellie, as a supporter, like you're a woman who loves a bit of Gaelic football, but you can see on, on the women's side as well, 
you have your tiers, obviously, your junior, intermediate, and your senior. You know, what would your take be on the likes of the, the, the weaker teams, perceived weaker teams in Ireland? Look, let's call it spade a spade, the Waterfords, the Leitrims. Like, should they automatically get to play against the best teams in Ireland? Uh, no, I wouldn't say so. Because, like, if you're playing teams brand new and they're hammering you the whole time or whatever, you'd lose wicked heart, like, in it. I think you should play teams the same level as you. Like, there's no point Waterford being up at the top now playing all these good teams because they just won't win, like, realistically. Like, you could give it a go, but realistically, like, it's not going to happen and you'd lose wicked heart. Mm. Like Jeff, there's no doubt that the best competition. You, it's even you can even argue the best competition through hurling and football are the national football leagues in terms of structure, in terms of ability, and the competitiveness. Sure, but um, again, it goes back to if you win a provincial championship, like you know, you've got four teams winning provincial championship in football, and then one team going to win the All Ireland, but. At least there, you know, there's five every year in championship football, like uh, within the county or within the country. And if you get rid of the significance of the provincials, like then there's only one team lifting silverware at the end of the year. Um, you know, so I, I, I would be for a, a seeded open draw, maybe for the for the All Ireland series. And then let the division three and four teams go into a backdoor and you know and 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 playing the Munster Championships or provincial championships as well. Like, but I think they've got to get rid of the back door on yeah, because like the interest has really gone in it there. I mean, people are voting with their feet. The crowds have gone away down there in was it 2018 or 19 that attendance at football matches was down. 23% or something like that. I mean, you can see it there in quarterfinals there. Like, people have just stopped going. They've lost interest. Like, so I, I think the backdoor system, there, there's actually too many matches on now. And it's detrimental to club football. Like, it's holding up the club championship. I mean, Watford is the best example of that. Like, you no, know, Ellie, you probably, Stradbally liked that down through the years when they could hold it up until the pitch got wet and they could uh, <laughs> beat, the, beat the Puritans. Like, uh, uh, Ballon the court and all them, but uh, only joking over. But uh, like it, it's destroying the, the system is destroying the, the the clubs, the club championships as well. And I think you're going to see players going away from GA if they're waiting like three months for, for between championship matches during the summer. I mean, uh, I I think the whole thing needs to be looked at again. Well, I guess. Well, look, you had the split season coming, which helps to a degree. Like, well, you, uh, I counter what you said there about, all right, in Hurling, for instance, you have the Laurie Mayer and those secondary competitions and you have the Liam McCarthy all the way up. And there are, and now with the Joe McDonough, you have essentially, like, you have four or five cups that can be won as well as the leagues, all right? Like, winning... <laughs> I, I, I mean, if I was involved in a county team nowadays and someone said to me, in Waterford, what do you want? Do you want to, to continue to play in the San Maguire where you get one game after seven months of training in Munster, which you have a high percentage of loss in that one, and then you go into the first round, and again, Waterford have only, really, I think they've won two qualifiers since 2001, so their win percentage is less, or is less than, you know, whatever, tiny, minuscule, or... You can play in a competition where you have a chance of beating most of the teams and you have an all ultimate aim of trying to play in Crow Park. Now, that to me is an absolute no-brainer. It also says what Adam said there, right, having played for Waterford for 14-odd years, some years you had the vast majority of the best players, but rarely would you ever see that squad of 30 translate or follow over into the next two or three years. Maybe we were lucky around 2009, 2010. They were the more, our most successful years. You, I, I think you're far more likely to keep the vast majority of your players if they can see a, a tangible goal from season to season to season, saying we, whatever it is, the Talton Cup, that we can win this and we're getting closer and we're getting closer and we're getting closer, as opposed to, you know, we've everyone playing 
well, maybe we're going well in Division 4. We go out, we get absolutely obliterated by, maybe you win one, maybe you beat Limerick, and you get obliterated by Cork or Kerry, and you're back to square one. Like, and then someone says, what's the point? And they leave. So to me, I think it suits Waterford and the vast majority of counties far better to have a structured, tiered championship than to have one single one like they've been doing and have a qualifier and maybe a good day out once in a blue moon. Well, the, the thing is, like, a lot of teams don't have had their, their day in the sun, like, done through the years of the, so the lower teams, tiers there, like uh, Wicklow and Sligo and some of those teams that, that are often Division 4 teams that go between 3 and 4, but they have knocked big teams out in the championship down through the years. And I mean, I, I think fair enough, Waterford and Kilkenny probably in football are, you know, two of the counties that ha have not had any, you know, very, very good day as well. <laughs> the year the Waterford beat Cork and the, um, what was the competition? <laughs> <laughs> the McGrath Cup. The McGrath Cup above in, in Clashmore that, that I, I still hear about. But, uh, you know, for a lot of counties though, that are capable of scalping a big team on the day, like I think they they like to be still involved. But I, I do think if you're a Division Three or Four team, you know, could you have a system where everybody is in but one loss and you're gone? If you yeah, had, like, uh, like I I kind of had a, a tier or top of four where if you look, you've touched two counties. Clearly, you had the ability to have a seeded a seeded draw with say four teams in eight groups and you, you could have say Dublin I don't know Dublin, Armagh Cork and Waterford and wherever you finish in the group one, two, three or four you go into a separate championship of eight teams like there's loads of games there there's loads of exposure there and you, you eventually end up at the level you're supposed to be at and plus it stops all the other some of the players like I remember the Carlo boys were whinging they didn't get to play against the likes of Dublin every year like how do they earn it? Do you know, <laughs> you don't see Accrington Stanley giving out because they don't, they're not playing against, you know, Man City every week. So, you know, but you, you may go point there, and I'm going to bring this on to Adam. Adam, right? Why is it? And Jeff made, made a good point, right? Wicklow, football county. Sligo, football county. Are they not the counties that we should be looking at going, yeah, you, you have to get your house in order? There's so many counties around Ireland that are very poor at football that have no competition. Waterford has the excuse of Ireland. But why do you think that the football is so poor in those counties? Like Longford, Wicklow, for instance, Sligo. Well, if I knew that, I'd say I'd be a, <laughs> I'd be a, a wanted man now. But uh, I don't know. I suppose it's just kind of a, it could be a thing of, if you look at Sligo, say, going back there with all, was played probably Mayo or Galway, like in Connacht in the first round probably got bit because they're, big, they're from the bigger county and then they were just knocked out. So they probably just, just going back, they probably just didn't have the, like they probably are smaller counties, but at the same time, they were just used to being bit and they, they never really had any success. So they they didn't really know, they didn't really know how to have success, I suppose. Uh, it's hard to put your finger on now, but it's, yeah, it's, it's probably just kind of a, could be a cultural thing as well. Like if, if a team if a team like gets a win or takes a big win, like they could get a few years of kind of a buzz around the team or like they could get a few good runs in the championship out of it. So it's probably like once once they get one win, they can build on that, but uh, it's very hard to get that. So you're right on Adam when you say population is the is the key thing, like uh, yeah, well I suppose they're when they're talking about splitting Dublin too and all that, like that's still that would still be probably about Five times the size of Waterford, like so, you probably couldn't do that either. Like. Yeah, but like, okay, I'm going to counter that, and I'm going to say that like Kildare is a massive county now. Like Loud, everyone says like I keep hearing Loud as the wee county. There's there's like 125,000 people or 30,000 people living in Loud because of the commuter belt, and like you see a club level, like teams from smaller villages can can maximize their resources and player resources from small villages, and we've seen it, and then at, at club level to go on and win All-Ireland Club Championships. Now, clearly it's different to county, but like, 
if you spread that out and you maximise resources over county. Like, Ellie, you tell us, right, women's football, Waterford were winning All-Ireland back in the, say, 90s and 1000s, right? And they had a lull for a long time. But, like, all of a sudden, like, if, if I call training out in school, Ellie, uh, for the lads, right, her in our football, I might get 20 lads in first year. I might get 40 first year ladies footballers. How have they encouraged so many players to play over the last five or six years that you, you've been involved? I don't really know, to be honest. I just think that when your friends are playing, you kind of be brought along then. And I think when clubs are starting, when they've underage teams, like, like if you're a primary schooler and then your friends are playing football, you kind of go with your friends and try new things. And like, I think that's really important, kind of starting a bit younger, because I think it's kind of hard for teenagers to just go and start playing football then I think when you start with a young age with your friends like you kind of keep going yeah but I, like you're being a bit disingenuous to yourself now like that like if you look at Strably for instance like Strably ladies football team were down junior only a number of years ago and all of a sudden they've started producing yeah. some fantastic young players so like it's not just a case of you're going along because your mates are going along like they've managed to keep those players and improve those players and all of a sudden like I see county teams there littered with those players so there's been, is there not a bit more to it than that? Yeah like I suppose like when you're when you're winning and when you're up there in like the top divisions kind of you'd nearly be more eager to win the next year and the next year and I think um you know like over in Strably we're all like good friends and like I don't know it's just kind of um I don't know I suppose it's like a good environment, I guess, like when you're playing football and you're winning and you're, you'd be happy then and you'd happy to go next year. So I think, yeah, there is more to it. So, Jeff, how do we improve it as a spectacle? Or, or is it fine the way it is? Myself. Uh, I, I think the game is in big trouble uh, with the last five or six years. I mean... I, I know the statistics are, are something like hand passing now, there's between 400 and 500 hand passes in a game and kicking has gone down to maybe, you know, 130 or 40 kicks, like, um, for kick passing now, not scoring. But, I mean, the, the skills that people used to enjoy, you know, was catching and kicking and winning ball, like, and now it's all about possession and, you know, uh, was it in the All Ireland final two years ago? There, that Dublin put twenty nine hand passes in a row together. Like, um, whereas like ten years before that, I think eight hand passes in a row was the maximum. Um, I, I think the reason people aren't going to games anymore, barring the All Ireland semi finals and finals, is because GA football now has gone. It's almost like GA basketball in that, like. When you turn over possession in basketball, everybody retreats and picks up their defensive position. And that's what's happening now in football as well. Like you retreat back and you build your defense along at the back there. And, you know, when you break, then you don't have players up front and you're trying to hold the ball and keep possession. But like nobody wants to look at four or 500 hand passes in the game. Like that's not what people want to see. And that's why they're not going to games. So... I, like they've tinkered with the rules a little bit, like the mark, which I personally don't like at all. Um, you know, and kicking the ball forward from the sidelines and that. But you, you know, the, the the change to the rule that I'd love to see is to reduce the consecutive hand passes. And when when they brought that in, it didn't have the support of the players or the managers. But I mean, and they only surveyed the GPA. But all, all the players that are on county teams are obviously on the panel because they're suited to that game. So, like, that's like asking one merchant from Dublin, like, own, we get rid of consecutive hand passing and go back to kicking the ball up in the air where you have to go up and catch it over your head. Of course he's going to vote no. He's about five foot six, like, you know. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's, like, I know I often watch there on RTE Gold, you know, some of the old matches there from the, you know, 70s and 80s and 90s, like, and, you know, it was catch and kick football and, you know, I know it looks sloppy and there was more errors and more breaking ball and that, like, but 
it, it was less predictable and there was more excitement. And I, I think if you just had it that you can't do two hand passes in a row, all of a sudden then, like, if you have to kick passes, like, like there's an incentive there then to get the ball forward. I think if you can move the ball a lot quicker and in, in more or less force people back to keep passing the ball, that, that you'd have a better game for it rather than all this holding and possession. And it's gone boring. I mean, I even know myself there, like I would never miss a championship match for years and years there. And no, I'd never miss a hurling championship match. But it actually there in the last two or three years there now, it doesn't bother me if I only see the Sunday game. And like for me, that's, that was unimaginable. Yeah, like I remember, I suppose during lockdown, the, the club were showing some older games, and uh, we, we won the county final in two thousand seven. And just just watching some of those games, it was noticeable believing from watching myself how much it was nearly almost every second ball I was kicking. And then you fast forward, say three or four years later, and I'd say, like people would say to me, "You don't kick the ball. Why would you kick the ball? Because you have the answer of packed defenses, and you're actually just giving away the ball." And like that, that that's a consequence. Like there's plenty of brilliant foot passers out there. But I think they're like you said, they're being swallowed up by like and like the, the, the horrible thing with all this is if the Gooch was playing now, you know, if the Declan Brown was playing now, like would they be able to compete? Like a lot of the, the top forwards now are big strong six foot two, six foot three guys who can win their own ball, hold off a guy. But the small nippy corner forward who could destroy you, his his niche is gone almost now. And like now they're saying is, you know, big guy up top or win the ball and that guy should be looping around. But like against top defences, it's so hard nowadays. And like we, we were talking, we were we were talking about the opposite effect last week on the hurling Adam about like is there too many scores in the game? I've regularly watched football, like say last summer or last winter, where it's four points all at half time. So, I mean, as a spectacle, we should have brought Billy back on about this, but like as a spectacle, it's it's to me, it's in the toilets, you know. And I, I I can I can only see it getting worse, you know. Like, how do you play such free flowing football up in Rack Armagh? Just pure class, I'd say. I <laughs> know. Uh, I'd say I just the it's kind of like what uh, Mr. Collins is saying there, like with all the hand passing. But the problem with most of the hand passing, like you'd see it in the Ulster Championship matches the whole time. Like one team would probably have six fellas uh, in the half back line, and they'd just be hand passing over and back for about two or three minutes there. But you wouldn't mind if it was just if it was just kind of. Like a wing back on the field, hand passing, taking it again and hand passing into a forward, like that'd be at least that'd be exciting. Um, but the way it is now is just hand passing over and back, and like it, I don't know how you could change it. The hand passing rule, I probably it, it is a good rule, but it would never get uh, brought in. So you probably have to bring in something that, like every certain amount of time or something, you might have to kick it, kick it into the forwards or something. I don't know. Ellie, no, so I was. Tell, like you know, even even if you could play fast flowing football, then you've got the extra problem of absolutely ridiculous cynicism and tactical fouling. So, like in ladies football, you can't do that because of the yellow card. Can you tell us a bit about like in ladies football, the how the yellow card actually helps the flow of the game? Um. Well, basically, if you get a yellow card in ladies, you get a sin bin offer ten minutes, but um. I don't really know do I like the sin bin. I just think, like, a player going off for 10 minutes can make such a difference, like, to be honest. I don't, I'm not really a fan of it. But I think, um, like, say, the hand passing, like, I think there should be some sort of rule brought in about um, you maybe... You'd have, really have to trial it first, but like a certain amount of hand passes, you're only allowed a certain amount of hand passes before you kick the ball, like say ten, five or ten or something. Because like football, it like watching it is all about like the entertainment, and it's just boring now to watch it. To be honest, have you been sin binned yourself a few times, Ellie? Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but like it, it is like even if you like. Like, okay, maybe maybe ten is a bit. They trialed it obviously with the the before the hand pass rule, but like but Jeff like 
there's there is it's, it's not just that. Like for instance, if you break down the ball, like the first thing that the top teams are doing is very, so you turn over the ball, they're looking to foul you straight away, 80 yards from goal. So like it, it looks innocuous at the time. You're on your own, say, 30-yard line. It's, it's, it looks like you know they're pulled the hand back or whatever. It's only a free, but it stopped that free flow attack. And Adam was saying the wing back is gone, one pass, two passes. And you know, is that is that is that not a, a bigger problem at the moment than the lack of kicking? I think the lack of kicking, like if, if people were kicking the ball, the game would be so much quicker that you won't have time to get all your forwards back and get, like Adam said, six across the half back line there and build your blanket defence or whatever you want to call it. But if people were kicking the ball, like that wouldn't be happening, you know, they'd, so they, there would be more space there. Now I know people have suggested other things, but the problem is one of the many problems is like whatever changes you make, it has easy for the referee to, you know, administer the rules. Like, and like people talked about counting the hand passes and, you know, counting like that you have to keep five forwards in your own half and all this kind of stuff. Like, and that the linesman could count that. But I mean, for me, I just think if you only allowed like two consecutive hand passes and after that, it is easy to count two hand passes and that way players wouldn't have the chance to get back and I just think like you know it would solve the problem of, of speeding up the game so fellas can't get back I mean they, I don't think they tried it properly like and they, they didn't even want it to work anyway you know for, for the reason that I said that like all the inter-county panels are packed with players that are suited to the game as it is at the moment with the possession and the rules and all that and uh, you know they, they've got a vested interest in, in not having it succeed does it but Adam like if you if you make a change like that does it fundamentally change the game well if you brought in rule where you have to kick it or you have to move it quicker like is it a different sport then it would be but it would be it would probably be more back to what it was like originally like if you even look, looking at the match 10 years ago it wasn't just it wasn't just booting it up in the sky like it was 50 years ago but it, it was, it was, there was a lot of passing into the forwards and the ball was being moved much quicker. Like So it definitely would change it, but uh, I'd say it has changed for the worse at the moment. And I'd say, like, if you if you brought in, you'd have to be careful what you bring in, like, because you see the mark and all, it, it does change it a lot. But I think it would change for the better, to be honest, if you just, to promote more attack and play. Because, like. like, Shane, you were talking about Gooch there, but really Gooch only worked well in the finish when Donahue was in beside him winning the ball. I mean, you could see up in in, um, in Ratcormack in three or four years' time, you could see Peter Welch inside at the edge of the square and, and uh, the modern Gooch here beside us, Adam, just winning cheap ball off him and kicking it over the bar, you know? That, that could be it. But, but like, when, when, Kerry, when Kerry changed and they put Donaghy in full forward and all of a sudden lots of other counties started doing that and being more... Or direct, you know, so teams will adapt to to, to the rules, uh, you know, when, when they see an opportunity or when they have to. But like Adam said there, you know, that the game is gone just so bad at the moment to watch like this. You know, I, I feel that's very something. Yeah, like I even look at go back to um Cavan beat Donegal last year with a goal, I think it was Thomas Galligan. Long ball in, ball broke. He just let fly back in the net. Um, I, I'd also like to preface there, though, as well, say that it wasn't just Donaghy in that Kerry, they had Darryl O'Shea, unbelievable foot passer of a ball for a big man. Uh, Paul Galvin, phenomenal, kicking diagonal balls in from the sideline. So, like, it kind of goes back to what you were saying there, that, like, you okay, gave the big man, but you've also got guys who can accurately kick the ball in into the right areas, um, rather than a big, long, dirty straight ball. If you remember that goal that Donny he got against um, Francie Bellew where the, he peeled off the back and caught it on the diagonal. Whereas if it had been kicked in straight, probably Francie would have absolutely knee in the back and, you know, put him in a wheelchair for months. So I think like it actually lends itself to two really, really good aspects of the game. The, the, the attacker inside, but also the accurate kick pass outside. Um, like... <sighs> 
Ellie, when you watch Gaelic football now, right, is there anything that screams out to you that you'd also like change that we haven't discussed? Um, well, I think um, Mr. Collins touched off this, but you know, the mark in men's, like, I don't like it at all. I think it kind of slows down the play and like, w like the pace of football has really slowed down with all this hand pass now that you don't want any more. Like, I know you have an option to keep going, but then like, I, I just think it slows it down if you decide to stop and take the kick. Like, I just think, I think they should scrap that. I don't like it whatsoever. So oh, I suppose, Jeff, I'll, t I'll put this one to you, right? Look, we're kind of all playing a bit of devil's advocate here because like you coach a team, obviously, within the parameters of the game itself. But you mentioned, um, like, you mentioned kicking the ball long. Does a lot of it start with the goalkeeper? I mean, like, we've seen over the last while, Stephen Cluxton, and every goalkeeper now is preaching, you know, short kick out, short kick out, short kick out, you retain possession. But then this lends itself then to we win the ball 20 yards out, 30 yards out, and we hand pass, hand pass, hand pass, hand pass. And now, like I know a lot of old traditionists would love to go back to just boot the ball out to the middle of the field, try and win possession the old way, swallow up, and then move the ball quickly. What's your take on that? Uh, I'd like to see being contested, a proper contest in the middle of the field. I mean, you know, the likes of Brian Fenton there or Dara O'Shea or, um, and any of the top, top midfielders that we've seen, like winning primary possession, being able to get up in the air, uh, you know, from the Teddy McCarthy's or whoever down through the years, like high fielding was always uh, a huge feature of GA. Like, and, you know, people love to see fellas going up in the air and catching ball over their head. And I'd like to see, uh, you know, the sharp kick out, out loud, really. No. Fair enough, like Cluxton is such a good kicker that, you know, he's able to kick out a man, you know, 50 yards out the field, he can kick it out to wing forward or whatever, like, but I, I would like to see the long kick out being put out there, make them kick it outside the 45 and uh, at least then, like, you know, you're, you're more or less forced most matches anyway to have a contest and a breaking ball in the middle of the field and I, I think that's at least one thing that's that's a good part of the game that they've kind of moved back towards it again there lately. What do you think, Adam? Yeah, it's kind of a it's a tough one because um, if you if you said that they had to kick it outside the forty five, you could kind of see that uh, the attacking teams full forward and just would just go out to the middle field and. There's just probably about 10 lads going off with one ball. Like <laughs> um, so I think you kinda of have to have a bit of a bit of like like you're, if you're gonna have to have some uh, short kick outs to keep keep uh, the forwards on their toes, like and or else everyone just be gathering around the middle. Um but it's definitely like you see you see some some uh, matches over the last few years. Where like there's two two man full forward line and every single kick out could be about ten kick outs in a row. Where uh, the cornerback just collects it at twenty one, and then carries it out from there. So that's like that's not that would be something you try to eliminate, but I don't know how you do it now. Yeah, like I know that a lot of teams now are kind of muting that they're going to play a full court press. So like if there are five, say six backs, but they're going to push up and play seven forwards and just leave them out at the back, which kind of forces you to go long. But as you said, then if teams keep going long, everyone's just going to swap out to the middle of the field. So, um, what do you think about any the the in women's game they kick the ball, the goalkeeper kicks the ball out of their hands. Um, do you think that would be beneficial to the men's game? Um, yeah, I think it would actually. Um, like you could kick it further down, I guess. Um. But you see, that is a problem. Like then, everyone would go out to the forty-five. Like, um, but you would be sick of the like short balls to the corner back now. That you nearly like try it. You know what I mean? You see, see if it worked. Like out kicking out with their hands. Hmm. Like Jeff, do you think that if if the male say goalkeeper kicked the ball out of his hands, that he'd be far more likely to try and pick out a pass, forty, fifty yards? in space, out of his hands, than off the ground? 
I'd say off the ground is probably more accurate. Um, I would think anyway. Um, no, maybe <clears throat> maybe it would allow them to speed the kick up or kick out. All right, they're not finding their tee and putting it on the tee and all that. Like, but um, it, it's not really whether it's kicked off the hand or off the ground. Though it's not. I don't think uh, going to be much of a factor really. Like, I mean, it's more whether. Um, you know, they're going short to the corner back there. I mean, that's just uh, destroying the game for me, like, you know, allowing them rolling it out there. Like, it's just so, you know, boring to watch. But, like, if you're up against a, a team with a good midfield, you know, a manager's going to say, well, we're not going to com- com- compete with these boys in the air. So let's just let them take it there and press up on them then and try and dispossess them. I mean, I can see. I mean, I would do it myself. Like, yeah, if you're in charge of a team, you're going to do whatever you can to win. But, I mean, in terms of improving the game as a spectacle, I think it's something they need to try and get rid of. Yeah, because, like, Adam, in in Australian rules, now I know they're all big men, but, like, in, in, in Australian rules, it actually changed where midfielders became some of the smallest men on the field. Like, could you foresee that if this was to continue, a short kickout, a short kickout, that you might actually, you know, like, but oftentimes, big lads made the team. They, they were they'd be athletic, but they wouldn't be quick. Could you foresee it where intercounty teams they're always the first to change that they could start playing much smaller, agile, and quicker men in the middle of the field? It would make more sense if you're a, a manager, to be honest, because like if you were going to kick a long kick out, there's probably there's never going to be just two midfielders around. There's probably going to be half backs and wing forwards and and. When you're playing midfield, if you have covered most ground on field, you're there's going to be the most space out there. You're going to have an advantage over the over the opponents. Like, and I suppose a few years ago, if a midfielder was just good enough, it, like if he could win every kick out in the air, like that would justify his spot in the team. But now, like, you'd probably get three or four of them in a match. But uh, the the your main role would be like just winning ball, picking it up from the backs, and moving it on. So it'd probably make a lot more sense to at least have one uh, smaller, quicker fella who can who can just take, carry the ball and take it on. Like. Unless you can find four or five Brian Fentons who are big, strong, quick, and brilliant footballers. Uh, Ellie, before we head, right, you're 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 the future president of the GA. You can make one change right now, any change you like. What would it be? Um, I think just make a rule about all the hand passing and make the game less boring. That's fair enough, Jeff. Um, I, I think I'd like to see, um, I'd like to keep the provincials, but have, have an open draw all Ireland. But I, I just, for me, the main thing in the moment is. The, the club football has just played second fiddle to so long, for so long. And I mean, if they keep the split season or whatever, but I, I think for me, yeah, one change would have to be to give um, predominance back towards the club game again. I mean, I remember playing uh, club football before and you could have two or 3,000 people at a, at a North Cork final. Like, and uh, no, they can't even hardly get that to some of the intercounty games because it's gone meaningless. So yeah, I, I would like to give um, the, the precedence back to the club there. Adam? Yeah, I'd have to agree with that, but the the club matches getting getting more time and getting more uh, platform, but for the intercounty, you'd probably have to look at something where Teams are probably playing against uh, like their own standard, or teams are playing against their own vision a lot more because half the matches are just like you probably know who's going to win. There might be an upset, maybe one, one, one in every ten match, but most of the matches nowadays, apart from all Ireland semi-finals or maybe a few provincial finals, they're predictable. So uh, you probably have to look at something like that, looking at an all Ireland championship where you just where you're playing against your own standard all the time. Yeah. I'd say it'll be a while. I'd say 2,000 people would be the accumulation of all the group games in Waterford football, if even, I'd say. Um, to me, I mentioned this last week. To me, I'd I, I just love to see something like in the rugby where um, 
an excessive foul and leads to an automatic yellow card. So if your team has made four, five, six fouls in a row, that the referee would just call in, you know, the next person in and just give them a yellow card who fouls. Whether you fo- have excessive fouling or not, I just think that would open up the game a lot more. It would get everyone, the whole 15 on their toes and it might give extra space. But like all those are very valid points. Um, because I wouldn't like to be trying to solve it, lads. I certainly wouldn't because I think traditionalists, you know, it, it's going to be incredibly hard to change because unlike hurling, the ball moves so slowly in football that one even one small rule change, it, it just changes the whole dynamic of the game. So, anyway. Hurling is, hurling is in a great place now because I suppose for two reasons, really. The, there's five or six teams all capable of winning in Ireland, if, if not each, you know, on a given day, like, and you know the problem with hurling is that there's too many scores and you know we, we kind of talked about it before that like starting a heavier splitter would solve hurling I think there's a bit of more go mode action in that but the game of hurling is in a great place whereas the game of football is in a poor very bad place and, and declining the graph is going downwards all the time and then that's the it's the, the lack of hope really in football is, is what bothers me that you know, they don't seem to be doing anything to uh, rectify it. Well, the Clonay Wizard himself, he slightly debates you on that one, Jeff. He he thinks that he can get out of hand and he, he needs to go back to p- the purest, the pure, hitting the ball on the ground and over the shoulder. So look, anyway, who am I to, who am I to argue with the greatest player never to play for Walford? Um, Adam? Uh, I want to thank all my guests today for the great chat. Uh, can I please ask you to like the video and subscribe to our channel? Uh, this is very important to us as it helps us grow the channel. Also this week, we'll pick our British and Irish Lions rugby team with former Irish rugby captain Neve Briggs, so tune in for that. And we'll see you soon on Extra Time.